For a while I've kind of felt, and especially with the eruption of Me Too and Time's Up and all of these gender dynamics becoming really central to the culture, it kind of feels like we're, we're stuck in a dysfunctional relationship between men and women that is now manifesting everywhere. Yes. And Warren, you've, you've done work with, with relationships for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. Do you see that parallel? And if so, what do we do about it? Yes, we are, we are definitely caught up in, an, in a dysfunctional relationship. That would be kind. <laughs> um, men, uh, we, you know, we're asking men to, you know, to sort of express their feelings, recognizing that we're repressed. We're so repressed that we're the sex that commits suicide at a, at a level of six times, to, six to one uh, over women when we're in our 20s and when we're 85 and older at 1,350% greater amount than, than women. And if that's not dysfunctional, then tell me what is. Um, suicide is probably the ultimate. Um, so in, in order for, so we're wanting men to open up on the one hand, and then we're saying, um, don't mansplain, you've dominated the conversation, uh, shut up, this is time for women to speak up, this is time for men to shut up. So totally com um, contradictory messages that men are getting, um, told that they're filled with power and privilege and yet, yet walking around in reality uh, feeling shamed and fearful and um, that women have a type of power that they're not even allowed to talk about because they're the ones with the power and the monopoly over it. So it's, it's, that is about as dysfunctional as it can get. We have to understand that we have these attractions to each other um, for, for fundamentally dysfunctional reasons. We were never designed to be functional. We were designed to survive. And now we have the opportunity for the first time in human history to be functional as well as surviving. And this is a whole new dialogue that needs to be together. But the feminists have monopolized that dialogue of women good, men bad, women the oppressed, men as the oppressors. And that's about as dysfunctional as you can uh, structure a dialogue. It's, as, uh, it's like a person going into therapy and saying, I came here because you know my wife is filled with problems and, and I have been telling her what to do for many years and she doesn't pay any attention to my direction. Um, and she's 100% wrong on these 14 different items. And I'd like you to help uh, align with me to help you understand how wrong she is. By the way, if you do align with me, I will continue hiring you as a therapist. I control the money, um, but if you don't align with me, that'll be the end of you as a therapist. And we're basically having feminists say to the world, if you want to teach in gender studies, you have this party ideology to follow. Uh, you, have to, you have to articulate that men, we live in a patriarchal world dominated by men um, that made rules to benefit men at the expense of women. And if you don't follow that ideology, there's not a chance in, that you'll get a, a job at any decent university um, unless that ideology is at your forefront and you just have your own unique ways, which we give you many unique ways, no problem at all, as long as you have unique ways of expressing that ideology as effectively as possible to your, to your um, students and do not deviate from that or allow anyone else to come into this university to talk in a different way about that. And so you, you cannot define, it would be hard to write a novel um, with a fictional um, situation that would be more of a dysfunctional um, dialogue, than, the, the monologue than the monologue that is happening now. We, you know, we've, we used to have a battle of the sexes. That's been historical. Uh, but now we no longer have a battle of the sexes. We have a war in which only one side has shown up. The other side, called men, have put their heads in the sand and hope the bullets will miss. That's a dysfunctional dialogue. <laughs> so what needs to happen to, to, to get out of this? We need to start communication training in first, second, third grade so that everybody knows how to listen to everyone so that the bully, so we see in the bully his vulnerability or her vulnerability. We see in the mean girl her vulnerability or his, her, her, her vulnerability. And we, um, and, and we have people share what they're about, what their feelings are, what their hurts are, what their pains are, and all come together to, to do that. This is already, this isn't just a theory. 
um, in Denmark, they're doing this in, in younger grades. And it's been very helpful in helping them have a much more constructive um, first, second, third grade. But I believe we also need to do this, not just in kindergarten, first, second, third grade, but, we, when, but when our boys and girls are going through that process, we need to have their parents go through it at the same time. Because if kids come home learning how to communicate to parents who do not know how to communicate, they will have a lack of respect for their parents, which will undermine their ability to follow their parents' guidance, and that will destabilize the family. And so this has to all, this is the number one agenda that needs to occur. So that's step one. Step two is that men have to speak up. Um, men have to be willing to risk their careers, um, as I certainly experienced myself doing. Uh, when I started speaking up about these issues, it was very clear to me that I lost my standing ovations that I used to have. And um, the more I paid attention to the dialogues that were happening, the, the, the discussions that were happening in the men's groups I formed, I formed some 300 men's groups, and you know that John Lennon was one, you know, joined one of them, and, um, and those were, um, uh, those were ways where men opened up and said what they felt in the safety of other men um, who were saying, gee, I f didn't realize anybody else but me felt that. And so, um, but then uh, when many of the men, w when I started to incorporate those, um, what I heard in the men's groups, when I started to incorporate men's pain and feelings into my presentations um, to groups at colleges and universities, I found myself going from very large standing ovation, large audiences, standing ovations, and always being invited back to two or three more speaking engagements, versus slowly all of that dwindled. And I knew that if I continued speaking and incorporating men's feelings and fears, uh, that I would continue to have fewer and fewer speaking engagements. And I had to make a decision. You know, did I want to have, you know, did I, now that I saw the formula, did I want to be formula speak and have a huge income and do very well and be very respected and, and, and applauded? Or did I want to go ahead and, and try to discover my best truth and speak up about that and try to represent and incorporate men in, uh, while still retaining a compassion for women um, and, and, and make that part of my life and my, my contribution. And I decided at least I would try to incorporate the best truth that I could. And that led to books like The Myth of Male Power and you know, that, was, that created a totally different paradigm uh, for what the male-female relationship was about and questioned the whole concept of men having power redefine power as feeling obligated to earn money that somebody else uh, I mean, said that the old definition of power, feeling obligated to earn money that somebody else spent while he died sooner, was not a good definition of power. That power was really about controlling one's own life, and historically speaking, um, survival controlled our lives, not human beings. Our parents and grandparents didn't talk about having rights, and, and um, they talked about uh, not rights, but they talked about responsibilities and obligations. And uh, when I decided to become an author, my father just laughed and said, you just cannot make a dependable living as an author. Uh, that's not responsible. Um, and it wasn't until I got my third book advance that he changed his mind and said, okay, you've proven yourself to be an exception to the rule, but um, you know, as a rule, don't encourage any of your kids to become an artist or an author because they just won't be able to support a family on that. Robert Bly talked about a father thirst in our culture that we're all thirsty for this energy. And in a way, you can look at the success of Jordan Peterson as this great need for that archetypal father figure, mm -hmm. kind of offering discipline, offering rules for life, offering meaning, offering purpose. Yes. And your work, The Boy Crisis, very much looks at what boys in particular are lacking. Does, I, I guess, that, what, what do you think boys are lacking from this absence of the father? Well, boys are lacking purpose. Uh, we have a purpose void, and then we have a purpose void combined with a dad void uh, that has left boys in an extremely precarious place. By a purpose void, it used to be that we had two senses, two ways of having purpose in the past. Uh, to be a potential warrior, and we would be called hero if we were um, risking our lives to die, uh, or we would, were the sole breadwinner, and no matter 
um, what type of personality we had. If we were to be a man, uh, we not only had to raise enough money to support ourselves, but to support our wives. And in the 19th, in, in the 19th century, it was often 10 children. Um, my father was one of 10 children, and he was expected to, his father was expected to support, you know, 11 people, uh, actually 12 people, himself, his wife, and, and all 10 children. And so that's a huge amount of economic pressure um, to take jobs that are not fulfilling, um, but jobs that are um, oftentimes deadening so that you can earn that type of money. And so, uh, and so now when we have this purpose void and we have a dad void, there's de the, the boys without fathers do have a father thirst. And, um, and they don't know where to go, especially in a world where the culture isn't saying to them, oh, you have two places to go. You can be, a, you can, you know, be disposable as a warrior, or you can be, uh, you know, do something you may not want to do to, in order to support, be the sole breadwinner for your family. Not to worry, okay, I don't have a father. He died in war or whatever. Um, uh, but at least I have the culture telling me I have two clear senses of purpose. Not true anymore. And it's good that we have a purpose void for boys. It's just terrible that we have a purpose void for boys at a time that we don't have that the ability of a, we oftentimes in many families don't have a father to direct male testosterone toward a constructive purpose. Because when male testosterone is not directed toward a constructive purpose, it ends up being directed toward a destructive purpose. And it's a very powerful force. So I now know as a result of the research for the boy crisis that, that boys who, that, that if we look at all ISIS uh, recruits, almost all the ISIS recruits have in common one thing. They are either boys or girls who don't have a significant amount of father involvement. When we look at the school shooters or the mass shooters, they are almost all boys who don't have a significant amount of father involvement. When we look at prisoners, we know that the only women's centers that we have in the United States, uh, we, well, that we have many, we know that we have many women's centers in the United States, but we also feel like, you know, where are the men's centers? And we do have men's centers, they're called prisons. And the prisons are filled with about 93% males. But what we don't know is that very, uh, almost the common denominator of those males is lack of father involvement. I just checked this out with the chief judge of the Superior Court of Washington, D.C., and um, he told me, and the other family court judges told me, that in fact is, is well over 90% of the people in prison who are males are males without significant father involvement. And so I discovered in just a hundred different ways that when children don't have their fathers, they have significant amounts of problems, but boys in particular have a greater amount of problems because they don't have a role model, they don't have a, 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 a way to find themselves as a male. We often do rite of passage programs, but rite of passage is only a minimal substitute for the real rite of passage, which is a father every day interacting with his child to, so, to learn when to take risks, when not to take risks, when to be assertive, when does assertiveness become aggressiveness. This happens from everyday roughhousing with dads, where dads say, no, that went too far. You can't do that. If you, if you continue to push your sister around or your brother around, there'll be no more roughhousing. It comes from dads enforcing the boundaries they set, that no more roughhousing means no more roughhousing. It comes from dads not taking that boundary and that punishment too far. It means, it's, means no more roughhousing till tomorrow night, um, but you, so you'll have no more pleasure tonight uh, and no more excitement tonight if you, because you bullied or you pushed your sister or your brother, um, but we'll, have, we'll continue it tomorrow night. Um, but in the meantime, um, here's th five things you need to do. You need to get your teeth brushed. You need to get finish your homework. You need to do something else. And then we'll have more reading time or some other type of time together. And so we need to understand that children, both boys and girls, need to bond with their dads. Dads and dads are very good at creating a bond through the excitement of things like roughhousing. Uh, they, they are very good about helping children be trusted to go out of their comfort zone. Um, if a boy or a girl comes home from school and says, you know, uh, Mrs. Moyers hates me. Um, you know, let's, let's, I don't want to be involved in her, with her class anymore. 
and moms will tend to say, sweetie, I don't want you to have a bad experience in education at a very young age because it could be f um, fundamental. So I'll go in and talk to Mrs. Um, Jones, the principal, about um, transferring you from Mrs. Moyer's class to um, Mrs. Um, whoever you call his class. <laughs> and so the, um, and so, but whereas dad is more likely to say, sweetie, you know, you've got to learn to get along with people uh, that you don't, that don't like you and that you don't like. So what can we do to talk to, you know, what, what would Mrs. Moyer say about you? Um, and what is her, what are her complaints about you? And, um, and then, you know, uh, the, the boy is encouraged to talk about taking accountability and responsibility and moving through to another level and getting out of his comfort zone as opposed to having his, his comfort zone catered to. These, these and about 10 other examples like this of uh, are diff the differences in dad style parenting that need to be combined with the best of mom style parenting so that the, the protection and the nurturance and the unconditional uh, manifestations of love that mothers tend to, to give um, um, are very important to creating the security blankets of children. But it's also important in creating the security blankets of children that children be um, guided out of their comfort zone, not just during a rite of passage, but during every day of their life um, with consistency that helps them know that, um, that my dad is pushing me, yes, but my dad is there for me. He's pushing me because he loves me. He has an unconditional love also. It's differently manifested than mom's unconditional love. And his unconditional love is not giving unconditional approval, but giving approval and disapproval. But when we, when we do things that are related to a healthy masculinity rather than a toxic masculinity or a healthy femininity, not using my social skills as a girl uh, to be able to manipulate, or my attractiveness as a girl, to be able to manipulate a boy into doing something for me that he wouldn't do um, out of his own interest, except for the fact that he believes that he'll have a, a relationship with me or sex with me, and I see how vulnerable he is in this area. That's a, an example of toxic femininity. And if and a father can help um, a, a, a girl through that process as well. You, you talk with Jordan Peterson about about this. Mm -hmm. What do you make, because for me, his success signifies how much we're thirsting for this father energy in our culture. Mm -hmm. What do you make of Jordan Peterson? What do you make of the Jordan Peterson phenomena? Yeah, I think, first of all, I, I would not have predicted it. So I don't want to, I, I think maybe I'm often called, in, among, my, among my people who agree with me, I'm called a visionary, and, but I was not a visionary in, in foreseeing um, um, Jordan Peterson. Um, I think it's amazing that an intellectual um, that is a Jungian who is, um, you know, who speaks in terms of often of metaphor and um, an allegory uh, that he has risen to such extraordinary um, success. And I think it is, a re it is in part a result of our enormous hunger. Uh, we, you know, we have, uh, we've attached to two extremely unlikely figures because of our hunger. The Donald Trump on the one hand and Jordan Peterson on the other, two ends of the extreme uh, in terms of um, somebody who's been willing to say, you know, fathers are important, families are important. And so Jordan and I found ourselves in, in a, an hour and a half dialogue um, in which I would give a, uh, you know, I would talk about fathers in roughhousing, and he would talk about um, some intellectual um, Piaget or uh, someone else who was, um, you know, who was in the literature um, uh, or in Disney movies or something else that related to that. And it was just a fascinating hour and a half, I, I think, because um, you know, I, I'm usually when I'm being interviewed, I don't learn a great deal, um, but I certainly learned. Uh, I, I, it was wonderful the way um, uh, we learned from each other. And in our, in our workshops, what we work a lot with is men owning their shadow, mm -hmm. um, owning the fact that we have an aggressive side, we have, there is a predatory element to male sexuality, all of this sort of stuff, and integrating it, understanding, accepting, and integrating it. Um, and this, this, to me, is at least sort of points away potentially through the dynamics that we're seeing at the moment, to be able to accept the shadow side of, of masculinity, mm -hmm and then stand in, 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 in our own power as men. Yes. Um, there's much less talk in, the, in our culture about um, the shadow side of, of, of femininity, the shadow side of, of women. Um, and that seems really unbalanced. Yes. 
Um, absolutely, and that's exactly, um, in my opinion, accurate. We're talking about the, I just spoke at a um, conference called the Wellness Conference in Idaho, and many, many of the presentations were on the, the divine female, um, but there were no presentations on the male, sh uh, the female shadow, um, or the, you know, the, the less than divine female, if you will, um, and yet um, there is a huge amount of co you know, co cultural conversation on the, on the and the male shadow, which we aren't even gentle enough to call the shadow. Um, when you hear the word male shadow, that implies men who are being introspective about integrating the shadow side of themselves into the rest of themselves and, and having um, an acceptance of that um, and, and, and are trying to become holistic as men. Um, but when you hear the, the statements about male privilege and male power, that comes from a political ideological place um, that really doesn't allow um, and that and, you, and those men go into college and they can't speak up uh, without calling, it, being told, oh, you're just mansplaining. Um, so we're telling boys and men on the one hand, share your feelings. And then the, the moment men share their feelings, they go, you're mansplaining. Um, and that's sort of like, excuse me, what did I do? <laughs> what was happening here? Um, and certainly, uh, you know, a guy that's in class in college and that is being um, and is sharing his his hurt and his pain and his shame and his and his shadow side um, openly um, and he notices that women withdraw from him in the class that if he had an interest in taking somebody out and in in, asking somebody out in the classroom that that would be uh, that would undermine his ability to be successful in making that contact um, so we have a, um, a huge amount of um, problem and so when I said before about um, we've taken a magnifying glass we, we've taken our binoculars and we've used our binoculars to look at women's experience of powerlessness and women's experience of male power, but we haven't looked at men's experience of powerlessness and men's experience of female power. Um, that's um, a problem. We're looking only at one side of the equation and we've done that for half a century. And it's so important that the conversation become more balanced. Male-female dynamics are an evolutionary tango in which every time you change any part of the dance, you have to look at both sides of that dance changing. Um, women do not worship men who are expressing their feelings and uh, they're, they're going, to, um, you know, they're, they're the first signs of what women are interested in is the cheerleaders cheering for the football player, which the, 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 foot, the cheerleaders are saying, hit him again, hit him again, harder, harder, or first and 10, do it again. And first and 10, do it again is first and 10, risk a concussion again. First and 10, risk a dislocated shoulder, spinal cord injury again. Because if you take that piece of leather, a hundred yards and it goes, you go across into the, and the, into the end zone, we will like you more, we will love you more. Boys are getting the message that girls like them and love them when they risk their bodies because that's historically an evolutionary preparation for them risking their bodies um, as firefighters, as, as in the military, being disposable. We, we have had no com conversation about um, the pressure on boys and men to be disposable what I call the social bribes, the social bribes from fathers, from mothers, from, uh, from women, from men, um, to be willing to be, if you go to war and you serve in the military or you're uh, an elite Navy SEAL, um, that you will be called a hero um, if you are the, um, the, 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 the male who is willing to die as a volunteer firefighter. <laughs> you're getting no pay economically. All of your pay is the social bribe of respect, of honor, of, of women being more attracted to you in your firefighting uniform. And that is your pay. But you have to realize that that pay is a social bribe for you to be disposable so that women and other men can be protected. It's one thing for you to understand that as your social bribe to be disposable. It's another thing to allow yourself to have that called male power and privilege when in fact it's male disposability. I'd love to hear you kind of summarize where you came from. I think you've got a really interesting perspective having been part of the women's movement and, and then you're, you're now kind of seen as the father of the men's movement. Yes, <laughs> it's ironic. Um, I start, I, yeah, I, and I did start out when I was doing my doctorate at, at New York University. 
um, the women's, I was teaching at Rutgers University at the time, and um, when the women's movement surfaced, I started incorporating that into my political science curriculum as a, a political movement. And my um, advisors, uh, uh, and I was also doing my doctoral dissertation at the time. And so the students in, at Rutgers were saying, man, when you speak about the women's movement, you got fire in your belly. And you, know, you should think, you know, what are you doing your dissertation on? And I said what I was doing it on, which was a different um, part of politics. And they said, you should think about doing it on something about the women's movement. So I went to my, um, to my advisory committee and they said, oh, you know, Warren, you don't want to sort of like uh, demean yourself with taking on some little fad that's going to be going away in a few years. And I said, I don't think this is a fad that's going to be going away. I think this is a, an evolutionary shift where women are beginning to speak up and say the old gender roles of the past were too rigid, we're more than just a, a role. Um, and I think that this is going to have implications for both women and men. However, I do agree that it's a lot of hostility um, for, toward men and, you know, and it may take a little bit longer to catch on among men. And so they said, if you really want to, go for it. But that got me deeply involved. Uh, and then that led to my being elected to the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City. And then I got reelected for a few years after that. And so I spoke all around the world on women's issues, the importance of women's issues, and why any secure man uh, should be a supporter of women being having more flexible roles. And, and also the importance of uh, this for men and for men to be a part of this process. And this was a place where Betty Friedan and I agreed very strongly. Um, Betty Friedan ended up writing a, a book called Second Stage that didn't get nearly as much publicity as the, uh, as the um, feminine mystique. Um, but when she did that, she said that the second stage of the women's movement needed to be men having more flexible roles as well. And this, she and I had discussed this many times, and we both strongly agreed that this is where it needed to go. Uh, unfortunately, the women's movement moved, started moving in a direction um, that was much less male-friendly. And the, and the key turning point in my relationship with now in New York City was that um, the uh, many women who were um, divorced were writing into the board and saying, um, I don't like your whole equality policy because that means that uh, men and women um, have equal rights to the children after divorce, when in fact, um, I know what's best for my children, the mothers would say. And so if I want to marry a new man, start a new life, move out of the state, and uh, keep my children away from the father, I should be allowed to do that. And I said, whoa, uh, you're talking about um, females doing what is best for them uh, without asking what is best for the children. And, and so I started doing some research on this and I said, from, from what I can tell, um, it looks like the children do best when they have about an equal amount of mother and father involvement after divorce. And unless we find out otherwise, that should be where we stand. The fact that that was the, the point that you kind of found yourself in conflict with links very much into the book that you've now, your new book, which is the effect that that has often on boys. And what, what led me to doing the boy crisis was, as I was speaking around the country when, when why men are the way they are, it got translated into a lot of languages and as did the myth of male power. And that led me to speaking in countries like Japan and uh, Germany and Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. And in many of those countries, after my talks, teachers would say, you know, I'm seeing a, something happen in my classroom. Uh, the boys are really struggling a lot, and they're falling a lot behind girls. And in my particular school, you know, both of the valedictorian and the salutatorian and most of the honor society or the equivalent thereof um, is almost you know, 70, 80 percent girls. And so um, that alerted me to something is happening here. My sister was a teacher. She said the same thing. And so um, I... What was this? Oh, this was, yes, quite a while ago. This is back in the 70s. I began to hear about this, maybe even in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, divorces were happening in large numbers, and I was beginning to see, um, and my sister and other people would say, you know, uh, lots of times when the families break up, uh, the, 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 the kids that are otherwise doing well, especially the boys, um, seem to really fall off in motivation and attitude and um, sort of withdraw. And, um, but those were all just pieces of information, but I began to feel like there was something there to that. So the first thing I noticed was 
that the boy crisis was happening um, when the United Nations uh, authorized a study called PISA um, of te tests that were being done of children in, uh, in the largest developed nations and in the less developed nations. Well, when I sorted out the 63 nations, the largest developed nations, all the developed nations had boys falling significantly behind girls in almost all of their academic subjects. So I started asking why, and looked at the fact that developed nations had permission for two things to happen. One was for there to be a, a, a divorces, um, and for uh, women to be able to, um, usually in most countries, uh, the women had more priority if they said that there was any challenge with the man or most judges wanted the children to be involved with both parents. But if a, a woman objected to that, most judges were afraid to go against the woman's uh, objection because if the woman says she was afraid of the man and any one thing happened, um, at any point in the future, the judge's career could be in jeopardy. And so most judges erred in the, in the direction of protecting the mom uh, from the you know, any possible um, undesirability of the father. So that was happening in the divorce area. And then a huge thing was happening in throughout most of the world, in the developed world, which was that as the world, as the developed nations had less preoccupation with survival, they gave more permission to women, for women to have children uh, without, being uh, without being married. And in that group, I noticed that there was a huge divide also, as there was in the divorced pe people. The, ch the mother, so in the United States, to be very clear, 53% of women under 30 who have children have children without being married. Now, marriage per se is not a, a big thing from my perspective, but it turns out to be a huge thing in terms of the, possibility, the probability that children will have contact with their dads. In unmarried, um, when women have children without being married, uh, there's a relatively small chance that those children will have long-term uh, contact with their fathers. And so I was beginning to see this enormous gap between um, children that had, had contact with their fathers that, was, that were consistent and that was significant um, and children that did not. And the children that had a lot of contact with their fathers, even if they were in divorced families or they were um, unmarried families, that small percentage of children that did have good contact with their fathers did quite well. Not as well as in an intact family, but close to it. Um, and then conversely, the children that had minimal or no contact with their fathers were doing terribly as a rule. And, more, and then I was ultimately able to research that to the, in, for the Boy Crisis book to the point where um, I was able to identify 70 different ways that children um, do so much worse with their fathers. This is true of girls and boys, but it was more true of boys. The intensity level and the degree of, um, and the numbers of areas uh, were greater with the boys. Why are boys affected more than girls? I think the number one reason is that when a girl has a single mom, she has a role model. When a boy has um, no, um, a single mom, he does not have a role model as to how to be a male. Uh, second, the culture has given girls much more, many more options recently. Uh, they, uh, a girl who's married um, can, uh, and having a child, she has the option to, be, uh, to work full time, to be involved with the children full time, um, or to do some combination of both. And where you know the, the since the feminist movement has occurred, one of the good things that's happened for women and girls is that we say be whoever you want to be, um, but we don't say to boys, you know, when the children arrive, um, you you and your wife should discuss who will be. Um, the primary parent, and you have as much right to be an, expect, an expectation to be the primary parent as the mom do, does. Uh, for, the most, for the most part, uh, the young male who's married, who's about to, have, to be a father, says, you know, I have three options too. I can you know, work full time, or I can work full time, or I can work full time. And there are certainly an increased percentage of dads um, who are uh, full-time dads, but it's really uh, still about nine, eight, ten percent, depending on the country, um, and the uh, and that and and among those men is a much greater likelihood of divorce if the man doesn't do something at home that produces money. Um, so, um, long story short, 
the 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 great majority of single um, mothers um, do not have boys that see a great deal of their fathers, and the boy doesn't have the old senses of purpose. Um, in the in the old days, uh, there used to be if you were a boy, the culture told you. You have two options. You can be a, a warrior and be a hero and be respected by us, and you could be a sole breadwinner. And so you knew that you had to march to one of those two tunes or both of those two tunes, be a warrior or a sole breadwinner. Now we need many fewer warriors, and we need um, women are sharing the bread this, the breadwinning role. So a man doesn't have to define himself as a man by being a sole breadwinner, and yet at the same time, if he's not a sole breadwinner, there is a challenge there as well. Uh, so a boy has to sort out, uh, what do I want to be? If there's, there's a purpose void in the culture for boys, there's not a purpose void in the culture for girls. Uh, there's multiple purposes for girls. And so a boy without a father and with a purpose void has a purpose void combined with a dad void. And the dad void and the purpose void put together are disasters for a boy because a dad who's constructive and involved is a dad who can channel the testosterone toward two things, helping his son say, um, what's your unique characteristics, my sweet young man? And then secondly, no matter what your unique characteristics are and no matter what fulfills you, you have to also be responsible for earning income. So you have to balance this sense of fulfillment, which I want to support, just, but just make sure that you know that the more fulfilling a job is, the less it's likely to pay. And so therefore, when you do a fulfilling job, don't neglect, don't just say, oh, I can do anything I want to do, because most women won't be interested in you, and you will not feel you're producing for the family and, and contributing in an in a, in a, in a, in a honest way. And so you've got to combine this. But combining being fulfilled with producing responsible income that can help produce uh, support both yourself and share the support of your children, that's a tough combination. And without a father figure there uh, to help a boy move through that, it is very challenging. Whereas girls have the support of both the culture, they don't have a purpose void, they have an expansion of purpose, and they have a female role model, um, which the, uh, for uh, her being growing up as a, as a productive woman, uh, the boy does not have a male role model. And so that's one of the, those are two of the major reasons uh, that boys fall so far behind girls. I also teach men's work. Mm. And what's interesting is there's a lot in the culture at the moment around kind of me too and time's up and mm. male behavior, really acting, men really acting out. Mm. But there's another side to it as well. I mean, what, what I often see from the men coming to the workshops that we're doing is a sense of shame around themselves as men, yes. of, of castration, of internalized, yeah, internalized shame around themselves. Exactly. Hashtag Me Too is wonderful up to a point. It's wonderful in the sense that we want women to speak up and say where, they're, where they've been offended, where they've been hurt, uh, where they've been um, misused. Um, that's a necessary speech set of feelings. Excellent. And there's more to men and women than women only. Um, there's men and women are men as well as women. They're boys as well as girls. I talk in the boy crisis. I quote um, a real life, um, you know, slam poem from a fellow named Royce Mann, and he goes, you know, um, um, I am walking on the street and I see in front of me a woman who looks back at me and she sees that I am behind her. So she crosses the street to the other side and then I discover how I should be a man. How I should, what is it is to be a man is I am a person who is, yes, I'll be a father. Yes, I'll be a brother, but I'll also be an attacker. What am I as a man? I am mostly an, att an attacker. I am mostly an attacker. What shame is built into that. And that went viral. And it went viral because so many males identify with that shame and so many women say, yes, that's what you should feel. You should feel that sense of, of um, humbleness to the point of shame at representing and being a white male. And when you go to college, if you express these feelings of powerlessness Understand, this is a time 
for women to speak up. This is a time for men to shut up. So you have white male privilege, so shut up. That's not a good way to bring a man into society as a healthy man. I look at, I look at Trump, for example, and I, I, I sense that we're so starving for genuine male qualities that people have elected what is effectively a, a facsimile of, of these strong male qualities as president. Does that scan for you? Yeah, yes and no. Um, I, was, um, I was an advisor to four advisors from the Clinton campaign and was a strong supporter of her effort to become president. And, um, and I kept saying to the advisors um, that, uh, that there's two major things happening in this country. Uh, one is that boys are having significant problems um, and that no one is articulating that. And, um, and that if you, Hillary, uh, speak up about boys' problems, no feminist is gonna leave you because you're speaking about boys' problems because their alternative is Donald Trump. <laughs> That's the last thing a feminist wants to vote for. Um, so you can speak up about these problems in, with political safety and with political enhancement because you can, because people who are moderate Republicans and are parents and are having a dysfunctional son who's a failure to launch will say, my goodness, somebody cares about my son. And most people care more about their children than, than they care about a political label. And so that, you know, this is completely safe for you to do. She could not do that. Secondly, um, she, uh, I said there is, um, it's working class families that are having that are, that are not okay with so much focus being on LGBTQ and so little focus being on the struggles that they're dealing with when, they, you know, when they've been trained as a coal miner and they've lost their, their coal jobs. They need to be empathized with and then they need to know that there's going to be a transition that you will help install to move them from their old levels of security to new levels of security. And it is not just the men who care about this because most of these men are heterosexuals. They're married to women who are dependent on them for their income. And so if you don't pay attention to them, their wives also feel threatened. And sure enough, 52% of non-African American uh, women um, have vo voted for Trump. And so I feel like th that the emphasis of the Democratic Party uh, in terms of closing out discussions on, on family values, on the value of fathers, the, demoniz the combination of the demonization of men and the undervaluing of the family led men and women who loved men and boys who were having problems with not being seen, heard, and not having any place to go. And what they, what they found was some man who was probably the most, who was probably the best personification of the immature shadow of masculinity that we could possibly dig up and have go anywhere and, and, and uh, that spoke with that type of anger and honesty. Uh, and, and honesty is one of his good traits, his own perception of honesty, um, and spoke up without fear, which is one of his good traits, being able to speak up about things other people that uh, are unwilling to say. Um, and they, they heard in him not just a political way of being, but an emotional way of being that mimicked their way of shouting out and making things crystal clear, black and white, um, and being so sure and so uh, solid about that, uh, that they ended up um, uh, supporting his attitude, uh, even though his attitude, much, much about him contradicted with their Christian values or contradicted with their values of, of being um, modest and, um, and not being a braggart. There are parts, I've, I've read some media coverage which kind of paints you as the patron saint of the men's rights activists and angry and regressive, troglodyte, all of those kind of, um, all, all of those words are kind of lobbed in your direction. What, what do you make of that? Why do you think that happens and how do you, how, how do you respond? 
Yes, I, I've almost never had somebody read The Myth of Male Power and say, this is an angry book. Um, and uh, I've never had, I've, it's rare that somebody, I, I don't think I've had a single person read uh, The Boy Crisis book and say, this is an angry book or this doesn't work to put help men and women understand each other. Um, I, and I have maybe spoken a thousand times in a thousand places. I have had that one demonstration, but only one in a thousand um, you know, speaking engagements. Um, and the uh, and and it, I don't I don't know. No one said during that demonstration. I read uh, the myth of male power carefully. You know, or I even read it. And uh, this is the problems I have with it. Uh, let's sit down and have a dialogue about it. Um, and at the same time, um, so uh, since I believe in taking responsibility, um, I have allowed myself to uh, defend and be associated with. Uh, people in the men's rights movement, such as Paul Elam, and um, and even though I disagree with much of the content of what they say, the very fact that I'm willing to say, listen, hear them, uh, behind every angry face is some, somebody um, who once heard uh, and then is listened to um, has uh, their anger dilute, diluted. So if you want to not just be angry at the angry people or hate the hate, hate the haters, um, you know, do, instead of being like them, um, be uh, open to what they're saying. They all, we all have a truth to speak, um, and so that has allowed me to be associated with as um, as opposed to just rejecting uh, the messages. Um, but I think that personality wise. Um, I tend to be at the op you know, I tend to be not like the Valerie Solanas um, Society for Cutting Up Men author feminists, um, and at the same time not like the, um, uh, the the men's rights movement people who are um, MGTOW people who are saying I have to go my own way. It's a hopeless society. Um, I'm here speaking today and around the world all the time because I still do have hope. Um, although I think we are, as you said, in a very dysfunctional relationship. So I feel like a therapist in a very dysfunctional relationship uh, where one of the people in the relationship is accusing me of being on, their, on, the, other, on the wrong side, their spouse's side.